Alright guys, how to go back again today. I hope you're all doing well and enjoying your day so far. And Doug Sinter Martin is back at it again, revealing a massive tournament apparently being planned right now in Saudi Arabia that just needs to be accepted by Activision and the CDL, but also saying that many players, not just in the challenger side, but also in the pro league side, are deliberately stat padding to retain their spot and make sure they don't get dropped while not really helping their team to win. Is this true? What players might he be referring to? We're definitely gonna dive into it here in the coming minutes. Very much enjoy to your thoughts in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you and you as always. I'd greatly appreciate it. It really helps out the channel. Thanks very much indeed for doing that one. Lots to dive into today. First of all, just wanted to mention a couple of things on the roster front. One around Gunless because I think a big question of the offseason actually once again is where is Gunless going to go? It seemed like this last season for him was rather promising. Gets on the Los Angeles Grilla squad. Back with Slasher. He had some great success with in the past. Seemed to be a great team on paper. They delivered some good results when Gunless wasn't there and since they brought him back into the team despite the fact that Gunless in the first half of the year, or when he was actually in the team during Major 1, was probably their best and most consistent player. For some reason, when they dropped him, Spart comes in, the Volk meta, all this type of stuff, just a you know, miracle run, worked in their favour. But after that, of course, Gunners comes back, doesn't really work out after he kind of had the surgery, didn't seem to be quite the same player after that, right after a few months off, so hopefully he can still get back to that form again, but more than likely, they're going to try and move Gunless onto another team. Whether they build around him again, seems kind of unlikely, not really sure what LAG are actually going to plan to do here in the offseason but Gunners, again, like if he is a free agent once again, he's certainly a big name free agent, right? But he seems to be in that boat every single off season. And I think his stock is still going to be relatively high, but it might be only a matter of time until like his stock kind of diminishes from where it once was a couple of years ago, to be honest. So we'll see what happens to Gunners, but I think definitely a big question really of the off season as to where he might potentially end up going forwards. This also from Clayster, we know that he is competing at the Chanders World Championship. We looked at the bracket for that slightly earlier today. And as Clay says, I had to do a video shoot today where I had to act. Let me warn you all in advance that I'm not an actor, right? I'm not exactly sure what this is for. Like, his New York Subliners contract ends very shortly after the World Championship, I guess, is officially a free agent. I think the way it works is there's champs, and then there's a seven-day period after champs. And after that, that's when the free agency officially begins, and I'm guessing that's when Clay's contract ends. Now, I don't imagine this is to do in New York. It could be some other sponsor or something, but thought it was interesting to think about regardless, and we'll keep our eyes tuned for this over the coming days. Let's talk Doug then. I know I'll make it. Never a doubt. Never. He, of course, wants to get back in the league. It wants to win the real world championship, not just the Chandler's World Championship, declines the spot on Paris we looked at yesterday. This a rather big piece of news though that Doug comes out with here. I'll share the clip for you guys here in a second. That apparently there could be an all expenses paid tournament in Saudi Arabia currently being at planned potentially for the end of August with a big prize pool as big as Chandler's Championships. Activision just has to approve it. So it's kind of a confusing to me to think what teams actually might be going out to this event if it does happen. There are some, I think there may be like one Saudi Arabian player of notes. I forget exactly his name, right? But it, maybe he's not even Saudi Arabian anyway. But you guys know the guy who will challenge Illy or something to like a four thousand dollar one v one challenge. They'll play on each other's host and see who wins. Like there's a couple of guys like that out there. I don't know if there's any like actual teams in Saudi Arabia that might be able to compete in a tournament like this. But I mean, it's interesting to hear about the possibility of a tournament going on there. It's not exactly a massive surprise, just because Saudi Arabian money right now seems to be going everywhere, especially into esports. You know, the ESL partnership, the whole like neon thing that they were trying to do in League of Legends that then got reverted because there was all the backlash about it. So like, um, yeah, obviously a bit of a touchy, controversial subject in general, but it wouldn't surprise me given Saudi Arabia's push heavily into esports recently that they're also considering Call of Duty as well. I might have something planned, right? Who knows? Doug reckons it's happening. He reckons there's a big prize pool. They're going to pay all the expenses for the players to get out there. Which teams are actually going to be invited or will be able to go? That's a question as well because if it's at the end of August, technically the pro players could go also, but Doug seems to think that he's going to get invited so um, and he seems to think it's almost like a challengers type tournament so kind of confusing i'll share the clip and then we'll discuss it a little bit more we're hoping that there's going to be a um a tournament coming up in saudi arabia at the end of august um it really just comes down to activision like if activision approves of it there will be a tournament that we will be attending in saudi arabia with all the best teams in the game and it would be an excellent way of closing off the vanguard season so hopefully activision approves of it because there's no reason they shouldn't. The tournament organizers are paying for everyone's travel, itineraries, visa, massive prize pool, just as big as Challenger Champs. If they don't approve of this, like I'm roasting the f 
out of them. Ghost of Hope actually mentions here in the replies, I heard about some people who own a competitive org in Saudi Arabia got invited to CDL playtest on Modern Warfare 2 when pros got to play. So this could be tied to that in some form. That's actually really interesting actually. If there's some sort of competitive org in Saudi Arabia, not sure which one that would be, that got invited out to LA for the playtest. So, I mean, look, we know how Activision Blizzard operates. It wouldn't exactly surprise me if they're trying to get into bed with Saudi money because every other esports, you know, company seems to be doing the same thing with questionable morals. Now look, we know, I mean, look, it wasn't even that long ago that uh, the Formula One race was going on in Saudi Arabia and there were missiles flying around near the track and the drivers like wanted to effectively boycott the race on a Sunday. Like, um, and that's just one side of all the question marks regarding a potential tournament or support from Saudi Arabia, right? I think Call of Duty in general has escaped without having to worry about that controversy so far, but given it's going everywhere else in esports right now, it's probably only a matter of time. So we'll see if Activision actually approves this one. Like, um, I mean, yeah, we know that Activision have a questionable moral record themselves, so it wouldn't exactly surprise me if they just, you know, stamp it and say, okay, the money's coming through, signed, sealed, and delivered. And I guess Doug wants to go out there and play a tournament, right? So I guess you can't really blame him. But given it's meant to be only a month away, it seems kind of surprising that uh, this would get confirmed and, well, announced within that time frame, given that the CDL and Activision tend to be very slow moving on topics like this. Doug also went on to say the following, though. Pretty good video he does right there, kind of a classic Doug video. Here we go, standing in front. You can even see, I think, like, is it the, maybe you can't quite see the jet ski out there. But I think in front of his house, there's some sort of like canal thing going on. And I'm pretty sure he's got his jet ski stored. But anyway, Doug's talking about the possibility and is raising the question, even though like he's raising the question, but he's basically saying, yes, I believe this to be true. Prove me wrong. CDL pros in the replies. And no one really was able to prove him wrong. That uh, some players, especially in challenges, but also in the CDL, are padding their stats deliberately to make themselves look better in order to retain that CDL spot. He reckons that challenger players, this happens all the time. Makes sense, right? If you're a challenger guy and you can, let's say you come top four to tournament, but you can, well, pad your stats a bit and look like the best player on your team, then you might be the guy that gets picked up. Then again, though, if you're sat panning and coming top 32, no one's going to care anyway, like a kind of Robbie B situation from back in Black Ops 4, when he was on that team and dropped like a 1.2, 1.3, the team got eliminated double first round or whatever happened at the LCQ, and no one really gave him a second thought. Hey, what's up, everyone? I have a question for Call of Duty CDL pros, top challenger players, Call of Duty coaches, like people who literally make decisions on whether or not you pick a guy up in the league. How important is the stats? And I ask that because now that I'm in the top of the challenger game and I'm like playing against the best players every day, I really see a lot of kill challengers. I see it in the pro league too. I'm seeing players consistently dropping really good numbers and losing. And then I'm seeing people like Paul X and Kismet who will drop a 0.8 and get first or like they'll be top three. And then when they drop a 1.1, they're three on a team. But I'm seeing people regularly dropping crazy stats, not just in the pro league, but in challengers. And it's like, what are you actually doing to help your team win? Like, I really feel there's this emphasis on players kill getting good stats to get a spot. And I feel like that's transitioning into the league and players are doing it just to keep a salary. And I'm just voicing that because that's my opinion. And that's how I feel. And I want to know if I'm wrong. So if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong because I'd love to be wrong about that. But being around Call of Duty and like winning in Call of Duty and seeing some success again and like seeing how winning is going to be working again, I really see a lot of stat padding. And I don't want to be seeing this. I want this culture to change. I don't like the whole like GG breaking point. Look at the stats. This guy had a 0.7. He sh Dude, I think there's a lot more to COD than that, man. And I can't wait till I'm back in the league. I'm going to be dropping hard 0.8s and 0.9s. And I'll be laughing at everyone dropping a 1.10. And I'll be winning. And people will think that I'm ass still. But it's all good because I'm winning. So... I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. So Hamza comes here in the replies. I don't know if he's going as Glow Frosty again or if he's now Hamza full time. But um, as he says here, that is because people think getting kills and trying to pop two pieces, three pieces every life, even if it's the wrong play, will increase your stock. Telling you people rather lose in challenges but drop 2.0s and throw pictures up, right? That's the thing. That's something that happens rather a lot to his players chucking pictures up on Twitter just to say like, okay, yeah, wow, look at me go. Like, um, and as, as he's saying, some players just go for the two piece, go for the three piece rather than going for the hill time or going for the capture just so that, uh, well, they drop good numbers, their stock will go up theoretically going into the Pro League. And honestly, they might have a point depending on the coaching staff and the people that are actually doing the research on this, right? If you are a Pro League coach and you don't really follow challenges that closely and you just look at the numbers, for example, from these tournaments, then you might think, okay, wow, that guy's got a 1.2. He must be ultra fine. Let's go get this guy in as the scrim. Whereas the guy who's dropping a 0.9 but is doing a kismet roll, for example, then it doesn't get so much credit, right? So I think that's what starts getting across. And it's honestly a fair point. It's tough to say 
day when you don't watch every single game to look at the numbers and really read into what they mean because sometimes good numbers does mean you're absolutely frank. I think in Scrappy's case for example everyone knows that watching Scrappy play like this guy's absolutely disgusting he's not playing for kills over and above like what he would normally get and he also knows himself right he doesn't need to play for kills to pump his numbers up because his numbers are going to look good regardless. But Jake Habir of course coach of Los Angeles Thieves actually agrees with Otto Glow Frosty here and Doug seem to be saying I'm not sure this always changes in the league right saying that some players in the league still think that getting the two piece the three piece will improve their stock for next season getting them not from challenges to the pro league but from one pro league team to a better pro league team or whatever or just retain their stock to make sure they don't lose their spot next season definitely something that we've talked about since really modern warfare and maybe even before that 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 was a big talking point I'm pretty sure at the end of 2020 I guess the season was when Krim was saying that some of these guys especially on New York subliners at the time when Krim 6 wasn't on that organization were just playing to look good to make sure they got a spot next season despite getting destroyed at the world championship. Doug comes out and says look I'm not worried about you can't making the wrong decision here I know you know winning and you know it's not always about stats and numbers I just feel there's a heavy emphasis on a spreadsheet over playing winning Call of Duty. Now obviously like I've rung some players here not to say these players are necessarily the ones doing this but I just wanted to look at really the numbers for this season so far I look at any players that have some discrepancy between their results and their statistics. Now I don't really want to comment on this too much just because it's incredibly difficult to say you can't really just look at a number and say okay well this guy dropped this number but he only placed this high and therefore like he must just be playing for kills. That's not necessarily the case. Then again we did see the other date with Attach that uh, Crim6 effectively said this as well right? He said that Attach is playing for good numbers, playing to pad his stats, playing to look good on the scoreboards so that he can get a big pay rise next year and the rest of his team are going to look terrible and Attach obviously didn't agree with that and then they had a discussion. Crim6 kind of backtracked but probably still thinks that to a certain degree. So this is kind of the list of players this season. Scrappy played one series for Toronto and dropped to 1.26 when was it Insight was the only subbed in for him something like that. Selium Dashi they have the highest KDs but they have had results. Same with Pred. Even like Hydra people have said that he's playing for stats a little bit but I'll give him a pass just because they have at least had some success made a grand finals like at won the Prime for example. Sib, Slasher they've all won. Havoc has been here relatively recently kind of a small sample size. Didn't really want to mention him and he's also like a fast paced SMG so I feel like he deserves a little bit of credit there. Shotzi, Simp, Insight. Dave Paddy here only had a 1.03 so when I got down to kind of the 1.03 levels I wasn't really thinking about that kind of stat panning too much because not particularly relevant at those levels even though Dave Paddy for a time did have like the maybe the third or maybe it was the fifth highest KD in the league. I think he had like a 1.07 briefly before getting ultrified to the end of his tenure on the team so maybe there was an element of that because of course he didn't really have the greatest uh, numbers in terms of engagements on the team that was always regularly talked about but the key names I suppose that come to mind here are Attach 1, Methods, Awakening and Temple in a rather similar boat with teams that haven't had that much success and in Paris's case no success at all but still their numbers in terms of pure KD it look rather good. Is that true what Doug is saying for any of these guys? I guess these are probably the four names you look at this list and you probably would pick out the most. Awakening as well has been talked about like this for a couple of seasons. Not sure it's fully accurate though but maybe there's an element of it. Of course Temp like you know Temp you can't really blame him in a way as well if he was doing this a bit because most people seem to think yeah maybe Temp was. He knows his situation was chalked. He's got to try and make himself look as good as possible which is probably fair enough anyway because look I don't blame anyone trying to get off the Paris Legion because you know you're not going to win anything anyway. You try and bump your stock up as much as you can. I think it's a very valid way to go for it. But yeah, definitely just thought I'd put this out there and leave you to discuss and think about this one in the comment section below. The other side of this, of course, is the players that don't have the good numbers, but actually deliver the good run, as Doug was saying. Like, well, look at the stats. This guy's got a 0.7. This guy's terrible. But actually, there's a lot more to COD than that. I think Doug probably puts himself in this category with the likes of Kismet. I think even a guy like Mac can certainly fit into this mold in certain situations. There's other players, of course, that fit it as well. But, you know, OBJ type players that do whatever it takes to win as opposed to just just dropping good numbers to look good for next season. So definitely an interesting discussion, I think, really, for Doug St. Martin. Speaking of Mac, he actually had a few words here saying that Seattle are seeking redemption going into the World Championship. Certainly fair enough, because they've been rather terrible as of late. And just to mention this, actually, I thought it was kind of funny. I'm guessing Skur, like the Skur song from the CDL, is like copyright free or something, because I thought the CDL had like the rights to it. But Fortnite come out with the John Cena thing, and they've got the Skur music in the background. So it was like pretty funny, to be honest. But very much to to your thoughts on all this stuff in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new as always, take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.